And it is a pleasure now to have Blake Courtright join us, the filmmaker. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. We appreciate you joining us. What inspired you to make this film? When I climbed Mount Marcy for the first time, the tallest mountain in New York State, uh, I'd hiked the summer before with my dad and my brother, and it was kind of a father-son hike before I went off to my second year of college, and my brother was starting another th stage in his life. So my dad wanted us to enjoy the time together. So we set out to hike six mountains. We walked away with three, <laughs> and uh, that was a, a humbling experience, but it was also a, an extremely awe-inspiring because we hiked up Mount Marcy, and me being the kind of aggressive hiker that I am, I got up a little before they did, and I got up to this little corner that faced southeast, and I had it all to myself, and that direction from Marcy, all you're seeing, are more high peaks and the lowlands, and there's no man-made structures at all in that direction. So all I could see was blue skies and beautiful clouds and tall mountains and lakes and rivers and greenery, and it just took my breath away. And I thought, wow, they could have shot Lord of the Rings here. <laughs> and then I thought, man, somebody should shoot something here. And on our way home, we couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about the imagery. I said, I've seen great photographs of the Adirondacks, but I've never seen really cinematic video of the high peaks. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Why hasn't it been done? I'll go ahead and do that, says the optimistic, bubbly 18-year-old <laughs> going into my sophomore year of film school. And uh, I thought, oh, you know, I'll do a feature documentary while I'm at school. Why don't people do that? I don't know. I'll just go do it. And I realized later there's good reasons for both of those things, but I, I don't regret it. It's been uh, from that first moment to the present, it's still, that image is still in my mind vividly, and it drove me through the whole project. So, Sort of an aha moment when you get up there. Absolutely, an aha, a uh, inspiration, a revelation almost of what I was going to do next. Because I didn't really have an idea of I'm going to make this big project. I knew a few years from then I was going to have to do a senior thesis film, a portfolio piece, but I didn't. that wasn't anywhere near my head at that time. And as you sat up there and you were taking it all in, mm -hmm. you thought about what it was that, that motivated people to, to climb the high peaks. Absolutely. That was actually... So because we set out to do six, we only got three. We got our rear ends handed to us on that hike. <laughs> um, I thought, why do people do 46 of these? This is like physical abuse. Why would you put yourself through this? And I saw the views, and I thought, that's amazing. But we also had a, 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 that same trip. We hiked up Tabletop Mountain, which really is treed in. There's a little view of Marcy, and I've come to appreciate it more. But at the time, I thought, this is, if there's more mountains like this, why would you want to do this over and over again? Um, what drives people, and that became this, the thrust of the production was a question. I didn't set out with an agenda. I set out to, to inquire and to discover what transforms people from casual day-to-day -day hikers into these legendary 46ers that's kind of a, a national and internationally renowned hiking club. What drives these people and what changes them? And as we see in the film, there's no one definitive answer. That is correct. I, I was hoping for a little bit more of a concise, nice little uh, media package there. And I think it's actually timely in today's day and age where we have so much in the news, where people are pushing this, that, or the other thing, to have a place like public television where you can have that clearer just this is what it is. And I think that the 46ers lends itself to that, that I just let the story tell itself. Um, and it's awesome to be on public television to share that because I think it's a great place for that. Are you an avid hiker? I am, although I actually dislocated my knee three times during production, so <laughs> I do not have my 46 yet. I'm at 18. Uh, but the film was never about me or my journey. It was always about the other people. Um, so people will ask me about that. Oh, why didn't you do all of them? And I said, well, I wanted to do them all, and I still will, but it's going to be a lifelong journey rather than a summer or two. So you're an aspiring 46er? Technically under 30, so not technically aspiring, but I am aspiring to become a 46er. <laughs> and how did that help you when it came to making this film? Hmm. For me to, to spend that much time and energy in a project, I have to be passionate about what it is. And I can do other things, and I've learned this. I can turn stuff around quickly. I can shoot on any number of projects. But if I'm really going to take ownership of something as a producer, director, writer, editor, all of that and pour that energy in, especially when I have other commitments, it has to be a singular driving force. Um, and for me, this was something I really wanted to do. I wanted to be in the mountains. And it really changed me too. I grew a lot through that, not just in my technique and as a, as a filmmaker, but also as an individual and as a person. 
and I, th I think it's one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. It had to be grueling and difficult. Yeah, we had very many difficult days. As I mentioned, we, I dislocated my knee three times on production while we were out there, so then I had to limp out uh, slowly. And I had a good team of people around me, though, who were very supportive and helpful, and I took the time to heal after that, and then it happened again. And so that's one aspect where it was very difficult, but also just the weather. We had days that were sub-freezing. One of the days we went out to shoot promotional content, it was negative 24, which now, having lived in Saranac Lake for two years, that's just another that's a day. Winter's winter. day yeah. yes. <laughs> it's a casual walk in the street. But at the time, coming from Virginia Beach, that was pretty jarring. Um, and that whole experience, carrying gear out there, it's one thing to carry all the gear you need for hiking, the food, the water, the emergency supplies, the extra layers, the lights, all the other things that you need. And then to add to that, camera equipment, lenses, tripods, audio gear and sometimes jib cranes, it became a much bigger uh, endeavor and we always had to have people with us. It wasn't something I could do alone. And so that was from the outset, I knew I had to surround myself with a good team and that made it much more enjoyable. I wouldn't say easier though, because we all struggled for sure. Some of those hikes were pretty grueling and sometimes we'd get to the summit and be socked in a cloud or stuck in the rain or stuck in the snow. And in hindsight, I'm very happy about that because it lends to the film's realism. Uh, instead of saying it's always all beautiful all the time, no, sometimes you're stuck in a cloud and rainy and muddy, and, and sometimes you have to turn back, and we learned that as well. And I think that's something that's hard for people, especially when the mountains seem smaller. They're not Everest, they're not uh, the Rockies out west, but they are very rugged and challenging terrain, and it is a true wilderness area, and I think people need to have a respect and appreciation for that, and we grew in that as we made the film. And that was a big part of your story. Hearing from many people that say, yes, this is a wonderful experience and there are breathtaking, spectacular views from the top, but be forewarned that, that yeah. when you take on these mountains, you may find yourself in some pretty yeah. dangerous situations. And we, when I launched the Kickstarter in January of 2013, our subtitle for the film was Conquering the Adirondacks. At the time, I was 18, I didn't know anything about it. I'd casually hiked before then. And people took issue with that. And hindsight, I see why. Because there's an old saying, uh, I think it's from a Himalayan mountain guide, that the mountain decides who reaches the top. And you're not going out conquering and putting this in. I just thought of it as you know, physical achievement. But then I realized that's not the spirit of the people that hike this. They're not out there trying to just check off a list. For the most part, these are people that are passionate about the area. And through that time spent there, they come to love the mountains. Um, and the mountains give something to them as well by being out there and being renewed and refreshed, developing deeper friendships than you could in a more casual setting. And for me, that was my experience. Certainly, I met and developed deeper friendships there. I grew. And it wasn't this attitude of, I'm going to go conquer the mountains, but it became a more of a reverent view towards an awe-inspiring piece of nature. That's a big part of your film and the story yeah. really is how the weather can turn on a dime. And that was one of the stories in, in the film that was really so emotional was, yeah. was the couple from Australia mm -hmm. that back in the 90s we heard from, from Sharon Moore, the widow, yeah. talking about how they came to the Adirondacks and, and they had 90 degree weather and they went up and they were totally unprepared and, and the weather yeah. turned while they were trying to uh, climb Marcy yeah. and uh, it cost him his life. And that's a whole interesting story because originally we had interviewed the, the forest ranger, Peter Fish, who was there and rescued her. And he got emotional about the story, but in the initial pitch, I didn't have any photographs of, of them. I didn't have any of Sharon's story. I just had Pete Fish recounting it. And it was emotional, but one of my friends from college who was an editor, she would, she would assist and edit on some productions for Discovery and a few other places. And she watched that and she said, you know, if this was on you know, National Geographic or, or PBS or IMAX, you know, what would you, you would see their photograph here. So we went about my dad being the producer that he is, and my parents are producers, not for nepotism, but because they really did produce the film uh, along with me, and I couldn't have done it without their assistance. But one of the things he did was he looked through the old news archives, found their story, um, and actually reached out to Sharon in the most gracious and compassionate way. I think, I mean, the letter that he wrote her got me emotional. As he said, you know, we have this story. I want you to know that this is a part of our film. And Pete Fish, and he stressed how compassionate Pete Fish was in the mm -hmm. story and that the, the point of including it 
was not sensationalism, but to serve as a warning so that that can be avoided for other people. Because they didn't know. It was not their fault. It wasn't arrogance. It wasn't uh, a, a crass attitude. It wasn't a reverence towards the mountain. They're conservationists. Right. They simply didn't know. And that's the most common thing that happens is people get caught and they don't know. So we wanted that cautionary tale. And she replied to us uh, and said, well, a blast from the very sad past. And she very graciously had sent us this piece that she had written a few years before um, processing that. And then we asked her if she'd be willing to read it. So she did and recorded that audio. And that's what you hear in the film is her reading this thing where she had written. And she's a writer and a conservationist and really... Um, I was moved to tears the first time I read what she wrote, mm -hmm. and then when I heard her read it, I was moved again. It was quite touching. It was, and then my composer put the music under there, and it just pulls your heartstrings out because they didn't deserve that. That wasn't something, you know, it wasn't like they were doing a dangerous stunt, and they, you know, maybe got what they could have deserved, so to speak, from it, um, or, you know, oh, well, that, that's the risk you take. It was an honest mistake that everybody's made uh, but not everybody's had to pay for it. You've been showing the film at screenings across New York, mm -hmm. and here in Plattsburgh it drew more than 600 people, yeah. uh, one of the largest audiences yet for the newly renovated Strand Theater yep. in, in downtown Plattsburgh. So we spent the three years producing the thing, and then we finished it. We had our premiere at Paul Smith's. This was back in 2015, and we did these limited screenings. Uh, this was before we picked up uh, our full PBS contract, and now we're getting to go to an even wider audience, which is so exciting. But in that time, we got to go around the state and to come into those theaters and see all those people who wanted to see the film, uh, that was a satisfying experience because we really shot it with a mind for a big screen. And that's kind of, there's certain shots that don't register the same as they would in those big settings. So those people really got a special treat to get to see some of those things in a huge screen with uh, the full setup there. And that was a privilege to be at the Strand and to share it here in Plattsburgh. I had a little bit shorter hair then. Um, <laughs> ha wasn't full mountain man at that point. But to be able to share the story there too in front of all the people and I got to bring on my second unit cinematographer, Dan McCollum, who was a Plattsburgh mm -hmm. native and worked at the station Dan for a time. worked here, yeah, yeah. at Mountain Lake Vivius. And uh, so he got to share a little bit there as well and we actually got to feature a short film that he had done about Carl Heilman. So it was a very full circle experience there to, to do that whole production. And yeah, to, to, to sit in a theater full of 600 people and hear them all gasp at the same time or laugh at the same time or clap at the same time, that's really satisfying as a filmmaker.